good morning friends uh, you know i join inoshi sharma to welcome you this morning and welcome our guest uh, uh, professor dr herald stosier uh, we all know when we talk about health what comes to mind is hospitals doctors medicine lab tests but health is about you know healthy food clean water clean air lots of sunlight and this we often forget you know there are a lot of people who you know go to hospitals and doctors for treatment but there are many of us who remain healthy and reasonably healthy throughout our lives and don't have to visit doctors too often so what is it that these people do you know to keep healthy is what uh, uh professor stoshiers you know work has been throughout his life we will learn a little more about uh, professor stoshier he is uh, you know globally renowned uh, uh, you know expert in complementary medicine and uh, his centers and clinics in austria and europe are one of the most sought after you know clinics and places to visit by celebrities from around the world and we have immense pleasure in welcoming you sir uh to food safety and standards authority of india which as you just saw started the eat right india movement to focus on eating healthy eating safe eating sustainably to keep healthy now i'll request uh, kavita kavita devgan who is a celebrity nutritionist to you know introduce uh, professor stushia and also conduct this session with him thank you thank you well i believe that the common sense evergreen rules of eating and living are the same worldwide and there are some eminent personalities who have taken it upon themselves to actually go around the world and talk about it write about it and also practice it and dr stosier is in fact a big proponent of this old school way of living and thinking and even eating so it is always always a pleasure to speak to him the last time i had a conversation with him was exactly a year back in december last year when he was here for the global launch of his last book the 10th one in fact that is how prolific he is in writing and after that book i don't know i don't know really know if there have been any more books yes. maybe okay so i should have presumed that there have been more books since then a lot many of us would probably know about him already because he is a very very well known name worldwide but for those who don't really let me just do a very short introduction He is the founder and the medical director of a very very prestigious Vivamayer Maria Wirth Medi Clinic in Austria. There are two centers there which are very sought after and as Mr. Agarwal mentioned the who's who the A list celebrities from world over and yes from a Bollywood as well frequently visit it a lot many times. He is he the best thing about him is that he combines alternative medicine with conventional uh, medicines and treats the problems right from the root he doesn't believe in quick fixes he's never believed in them in fact some of the ways that he propagate are the ways that have been actually a part correct me sir if i'm wrong of ayurveda and the ancient uh, policies that we've been following in our country as well so which again goes to the prove the very same point which i said right in the beginning that the same rules actually stand the test of time and these are the common sensical rules and they are evergreen so i'm really happy for this opportunity mr agarwal 
uh, Chairperson Ma'am, to be here to speak to him again. And I'm going to try that we all learn a little more from Dr. Stosia as to how to live a happier, healthier, and more sustainable life here on. Welcome, sir. Thank you. First of all, uh, I was just thinking we could show the short film we have on Dr. Stosia. Yes, that'll be lovely. Yeah. So can we just have that short film, please? My name is Dr. Harald Stosia. I'm a general practitioner from Austria and the head physician of Weber Meyer. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to speak at the Eat Right campaign because uh, nutrition is uh, important for all of us around the globe. We have to talk about nutrition and how to eat in the right way. I think that what Weber Meyer can offer is that we can focus on the eating habit because that's more important than the food itself. The eating habit is in the self-responsibility of every human being and of course we eat different foods in different areas of this world. Yes, it's right, we have to look at the food to have the healthiest food we can get, we have to eat sustainable food, we have to look at the production of the food and the preparation of the food. But at the end it's more important to eat slowly, to chew well, to take time for our meals, to enjoy them and also to respect the natural routine and the rhythm. We know we have more capacity to digest food in the morning and less in the evening. So all these habits have an influence on our health and it's important to create awareness that every body has the possibility to change the eating habits into a healthier eating habit, to protect us from different diseases, to stay as healthy as possible and if necessary we also have the possibility to treat diseases uh, with fasting and detoxification. So fasting should be part of our healthy nutrition and also as Gandhi said it's the first step uh, you have to uh, do and fasting is one of the strongest possibilities. It gives us the possibility to look in the inside and what fasting is for the inside, the eyes are for the outside. So we want to create awareness that uh, nutrition and fasting fits together to stay healthy and to treat different diseases. Yeah, actually in a nutshell, we'll try and you know, pick his brain a little more about a few more of these topics. Dr. Saucy, first things first, let's cover the basics. According to you, what exactly is the definition of well-being? When is a person well? And also, this term holistic living is thrown about very casually these days. So according to you, how can one really live holistically in the true sense of the world? Yeah, first of all, good morning to everybody and it's a pleasure for me and thanks for the invitation to this wonderful organization to speak and to share the, the experience we have in Austria at the Viva Meyer centers and especially my experience on nutrition. Um, if you ask what's well-being, uh, I think we should uh, try to define it more positively than negative. If you look at the uh, WHO, you define a health person without any disease. So in a medical center and also in a medical field, a little bit humoristically we say, if you feel well, you are not diagnosed well. Um, you always find some issues and of course we are not in an optimal condition and I think that's one of the major problems. If we think holistically, we are in a situation that we feel well, means we are physically okay, emotionally okay, spiritually okay, but we are also in a social environment where we feel well. We are trained as a medical doctors more in pathologies, and pathology means, for example, if you get a cold, we know exactly the cause of the cold, we know the virus, we know the time to get infected, we know the therapy, and we know how long it will last to get rid of the complaints, and we also know the side effects of all these diseases and uh, the therapies. But if you ask, uh, as you did before, those people who are not infected by that virus, what are they doing? How do they eat? How do they live? And this is what uh, modern medicine is talking about. We call it uh, uh, to look at the health, to look at uh, those parameters to stay really healthy. Um, this is called salutogenesis, in uh, opposite of pathogenesis. Okay. And the most important is to be in a social environment where we feel well. 
That could be the family, that could be a company, that could be any society body. And I think this is one of the most important things we are missing in the modern life. This is the reason we have so many chat friends and we have WhatsApp groups and we have so many social groups to feel in this social body because we lost our social environment in the families and so on. I think that's also an important part. And um, it's important to talk when we talk about food. It's important to talk about how the food is produced. But it's also important to talk who is preparing the food. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And it's important to talk about respect of uh, those who are producing the food, respect to the nature, um, to give us all these wonderful foods. You can discuss to go for a vegetarian, plant-based diet or not, but you have to have respect against all these um, foods. But you also have to pay respect to yourself because you are worse to be nourished in the best way. And this is again, we have to talk in that moment, we have to talk about the eating habit. If you think you can gulp down the food very quickly, uh, you don't get the benefits. And maybe you have some companies like uh, uh, McDonald's here, and if you go there and eat a Big Mac very quickly, slowly, no, the opposite way, slowly, and you chew it very well, you may get the last vitamin if there's a salad leaf in this Big Mac. Yes. Yeah? <laughs> and if you go to the best organic uh, food yeah. and uh, the restaurant has prepared the food very well, it's organic food prepared with a lot of love, and you eat it without respect to all these components, you don't get the benefits, the opposite will happen, you get a lot of maldigestive process. And this is what happens in our days. We have a society to go. Everybody is grabbing something in between. You're on your mobile in between, you have the computer. I give you an example. I've been, I'm traveling a lot around the world, and I've been in lunch in the, in the airport a few days ago, and sitting there next to me, a businessman came, and he put First the laptop, then the, then the iPad, and at least the phone. Then he went to the bar. He has taken some items from the food. He sat down, then he got the call. He writes something in the, in the computer. And within 30 seconds, he has eaten all the meals. Yeah? <laughs> if I would have asked him what he has eaten, I'm sure he didn't know. Yes. Yeah? Because nobody pays respect at the time where yeah. you want to eat the food, yeah? what it is. And again, if you say, I like to eat because I like the taste of the food. If you want to taste the food, you have to chew the food. Yeah? And to get all these wonderful qualities of the food, you have to chew it. And the chewing process is also important because you give the information to the body what kind of food you have eaten, how to digest the food. Nobody thinks that we have to digest the food. We are only talking about the food. But you have to digest the food to get all the ingredients. And the body has to be informed about what kind of food and how to digest the food. And that happens in the mouth. And that doesn't happen in 30 seconds. Yeah. So you need to chew every bite very thoroughly to get the chemical reaction between food and saliva to give the information to the body how to digest it. If you eat it very quickly and you swallow, it takes 30 minutes from the stomach to inform the brain. Mm -hmm. And in the meanwhile, all the bacteria, and we have millions of bacteria in our body, they are very happy to work about, uh, to, to have this food and uh, to get it. And they create a lot of maldigestive process, fermentation and putrefaction. So we have to discuss alcohol problems. We create a lot of alcoholic maldigestive processes if you eat the wrong food at the wrong time, meaning raw food in the evening. Yeah. So the eating habit, I think, is more important than the food itself. Of course, everybody is talking about food, and we have to talk about the right combination of food and the relation of food. But the first step is to eat the right food in the right way. You talk a lot about habits, in fact, and that is what your programs, I suppose, are mostly focused on. So these habits, these small habits, the couple of them that you've mentioned, they're not really that difficult, I think, to master, or are they? Originally, we were doing, following a lot many of these earlier in our ancient uh, way of eating as well. So do you think the answer to our present and the future problems lies in going back to our roots? Do the answers hide there? Should we be like looking at the past um, to look, take care of our future? I think so, yes, because 
Sometimes I have the feeling I inform people about what we have learned from our grandparents. True. Yeah? This is not my wisdom, this is what we have learned from the generations before us. And uh, we have seen the very short film about uh, um, this autophagia process in 2016, the Nobel Prize uh, was awarded to this uh, group of uh, Japanese researchers. And a lot of research was already done also in Austria. And we have at the University of Graz also a group working with it, uh, in this research. But again, this is now the scientific proof and way of what we know since generations. Fasting helps us to stay healthy. Why is fasting a recommended uh, procedure in, around the world, around the globe, every society, every religion recommends it? Of course, in different ways, but at the end, it's the same. Mm, true. We have used that in the medical strategies for many decades, but we lost it because of modern pharmacies, companies, whatever they think a drug is better than a day of not eating. Yeah? It's not. But again, if you do intermittent fasting, because that's the result of this process of autophagia, if you do intermittent fasting against the natural routine, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So if you think you can eat late in the evening and then take 16 hours off, it's wrong. We know in this very short uh, video I have explained that we have more capacity to digest food in the morning and less in the evening. Take breakfast like a king, lunch like a citizen, dinner like a beggar. That's not my saying, that's an old uh, knowledge. Everywhere around the world you can have this knowledge. If you do this routine, automatically if you eat less in the evening, you have a kind of an intermittent fasting. In the modern medicine, we call it uh, dinner canceling. Mm. Because modern medicine uses English wordings. In the older days, we had the Latin as a language in the medicine, and we said it's... Uh, um, intestinal auto-intoxication. So that means we got a lot of toxins from the maldigestive process of the intestine. So if you do this intermittent fasting according to the written, it works. If you do it against the routine, it doesn't work. So again, we have to respect the natural routine. And if you look in our days, people go out, also in India, sorry to say, but you eat late. Yeah. Yeah, if you go at 8 in the, in the restaurant, nobody is there. If you go there at 10, 11, Back. people are happy to mm -hmm. dine, and they have all these wonderful foods there. I like the Indian cuisine, but it's, <laughs> sorry, it's not easy digestible. Yeah. If you have the dal in the evening, wonderful, but it's heavy. Yes. Yeah. And if you eat the dal in the evening, I'm sure uh, this is one of the reasons you have a lot of maladjustive processes also here in India. Yeah? It's not only the dal, by the way, but there the are <laughs> a few other things too. Um, so if you do it against the natural routine, it doesn't help you. Yeah? And what we do in our medical therapies, we try to train and educate people in this routine first. because. Uh, we have guests from all over the world, and if we would focus on one specific food, yeah, it's the wrong food for the Indian, for the Americans, for the Russians, for the Arabs, for the Europeans. Yeah? But the eating habit is always the same. If you eat your food, which is your locally organic, best quality food, yeah, and if you eat it slowly, you can protect yourself. If you eat less yeah, at that time, you offer the possibility to the body to to detoxify, to help the body to get the strength back. And uh, of course, fasting is one of the strongest therapies we have in the medical field, and we should use that much more than any medicines. See, it is, doctor, increasingly getting clear that modern medicine is now about reaching the point wherein it's proving all that was being followed logically over the years. Step by step, we are proving all those one of all these things right: intermittent fasting, eating slowly, focusing on the food. Like you mentioned, nobody really looks at the food anymore. So a lot of these are being proven now. All these old things. Another uh, factor which has now been proven without any doubt, and that is something Ayurveda has been, you know, it has been the biggest pillar of Ayurveda over the years. Is that first you need to focus on your gut. Your gut health is the most important. Once you take care of that, it takes care of everything else in your body. Mm -hmm. And you, in fact, 
never tire of saying that you are not what you eat, you are what you digest. And that's something that, that is a very simple way of getting this message across. So it's not just focusing on what is on your plate, but making sure that your gut is able to actually get some goodness out of it. So at Viva Meyer, do you focus a lot on gut health as well? And also, if you could just share with everybody who's watching a few simple ways, you know, the way we can take care of our gut and make sure that it becomes a little more alkaline right, mm. compared to the acidic gut that most of us are saddled with these mm. days. Um, yes, I think you're absolutely right. Um, we are what we digest, and that's totally different. You are what you eat, because if you are what you eat, you look at the plate, what kind of food, and we are focusing on the food, the combination, whatever. If we say you are what you digest, the food is important, but more important what we create out of the food. For example, if you eat the best, you said alkaline acid, alkaline food, vegetables in a wrong way, wrong preparation as a raw salad at the wrong time in the evening, you're not able to digest it properly and your intestinal bacteria are happy to metabolize that, but you create fermentation. And fermentation gives you alcohol, gas, and a lot of acidity. So the best food at the wrong time creates a lot of problems in the intestine, and because of that, also in the whole organism. We can say the intestine is our common kitchen of our body, yeah? and what comes out from that kitchen, the quality we offer to all our cells, influences the quality of our metabolism, influences the quality of our lifestyle especially our brain too and our sharp thinking and so on. So everything is influenced by the, the quality of the food we get out of the intestine. So this is one of the reasons in the therapy we want to establish or re-establish a strong and healthy digestive system. The only influence, and you can try, and every cardiac can prove that, if you try to uh, ask your stomach to be a little bit more active because you forgot to chew, Try what answer you will get. Have you ever tried to ask your stomach for this? If you get an answer, let me know, I will publish it. But the only way to influence your intestines by chewing, as long as you have the food in your mouth, you decide how often you chew it, how intensive you chew it, how intensive you mix it with the saliva. At the moment where you have swallowed the food, you have no influence. The only way to digest it is the chemical process. We have a lot of enzymes to do so. And you can train yourself. You take a piece of bread and you have wonderful chapatis here. I, I wouldn't recommend to take a fresh one. It's too easy with the fresh one. Take an old one, one day old, and chew that chapati 40, 50 times as long as you feel it tastes sweet because there's a lot of cereal and in the cereals you have the carbohydrates. And the better your chewing will be, the more um, sweet you will taste from this, from this bread. Uh, this is to give you an idea how the quality of your digestive system is. But don't take a sweet one, take a pure one, yeah? because then it's, then it's very uh, easy. Uh, so to train the chewing, I think it's the most important to also to activate the whole process of intestines. We know in the meanwhile, and there's a lot of research at the moment on the microbiome. That means the summary in, in total, we have billions of bacteria. And we think that they influence us more than we believed until now. Um, the influence could be that we choose our food because of the intestines. That uh, influence could be that diabetic persons and so on have a different uh, bacterial flora. So maybe the bacterial flora is as individual as our footprint and fingerprint. But uh, we get more and more information. But we have billions of bacteria. We think we have about 500 families of bacteria in our intestine, and we know maybe 50 by name. So you see there's a lot of research in the next uh, couple of years necessary to, to get more knowledge about that. But also to give you an idea how that, how that works, we know if you uh, have, for example, an emotional problem and depressive disorder, something like that, the intestine is important too. Yes. Because we know that those who eat a lot of fruits yeah, and not able to digest that huge amount of fruits create a kind of maldigestion in the intestine, plus 
they get the complexation of fructose and tryptophan. And tryptophan is an amino acid we need for serotonin and melatonin. So bad mood, sleeping problems, and healthy diet, because we recommend to eat a lot of fruits and so on. If you're not able to metabolize that, they lead to depressive disorders and sleeping problems. So we know there's a lot of influence on every different disease from the intestine. And I think in the future we will uh, get more and more information on how important the intestine is. But nevertheless, this is the biochemical background. And the only way to influence that mm -hmm. is, of course, to choose the right food. I agree totally. But then to eat the right food in the right way. And this is also important for the therapy when we are talking about fasting. Fasting in the original meaning of the world means to take only liquids not a food you have to digest and to chew. That's not possible for everybody if we use fasting as a therapy. If a healthy person wants to fast, that's okay to do, let's say, one day only drinking liquids, whatever. But in a medical therapy, we have to do it very individualized. And therefore, we need the diagnostics first. Then we have to individualize the therapy. This is what we do at, at the Viva Maya. We do um, the individualized therapy, uh, uh, diagnostics according to Maya. Then we do a functional muscle test. We measure the different minerals, vitamins, trace elements, which is also important. And then we have an absolutely individualized therapy. And fasting in that means meaning is could be only giving some liquids, but it could be also that we have, for example, in very easy and light digestible food, some vegetables, but these vegetables have to be chewed very thoroughly. So minimum of food, but optimal digestion to offer the possibility to eliminate, to detoxify, to cleanse the intestine. We do a lot of cleansing. Um, it is very similar to your panchakarma cures you have in the Ayurvedic treatment, but there's one major difference between uh, the Western and the Eastern uh, way. In the Western medicine, we are focusing more on the water-soluble part, mm -hmm. in the Ayurvedic, more on the fat-soluble part. Um, so we don't use the oil, we don't use the ghee, and we don't use um, this, this way of detoxification. We have more the Epsom salt, more the water, more the minerals. But because of the importance of both parts, we have combined that, and we use a lot of oil in our centers, but not for the therapies, but for the digestion itself and for the, for the healthy food itself. So for me, the biggest takeaway is that the gut health will, is actually detrimental to my happiness as well. Yes, absolutely right. So it's not are, just the physical symptoms, it's the mind and the heart, everything is connected to how your gut is behaving. That's right. We have the same amount of nerve cells in yes. the intestine. We have the same transmitters. For example, more than 90% of serotonin, this uh, transmitter which is important in the brain, is produced in the intestine. So we can say if your intestine is happy, you are happy too. True. That is a connect not many people make, and I feel that is a good uh, lesson to take from here. On a lighter note, I personally would really like to know about your opinion about keto diets. Mm. A lot many people, very, I'm sure, would want to know a little bit about what you feel about it. A very simple answer would be next question, but I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you're not happy with that. <laughs> yeah, we get uh, the answer with that, so we can move on to the next question. Um, also, a big problem in our country in particular, I feel, is protein. Yeah, that's, Both the that's quality keto diet. <laughs> and the quantity of yeah. protein that we consume. Do you personally think it's impossible to get enough good protein on a vegetarian diet? Or you think it is very much possible? It is possible. There is no need to yeah. have animal protein. That's your personal decision. If you are going for a plant-based diet, you have to know that you don't have in any plant all the essential amino acids we need for our life. There's also a, maybe a possibility to get a deficiency of different uh, micronutrients we have seen. This is the folic acid, this is B12, this is maybe some iron, whatever. But that can be handled if you choose the right food in the right combination. Um, but you don't have all the amino acids in, in one plant. If you take um, animal uh, sources, animal foods, you have all the essential amino acids, for example, in meat, in fish, in cheese, they are all in. If you, if you eat eggs, you have all these amino acids in. But there's also another difference. For example, if you look at the digestibility, 
fish is much easier digestible than legumes. If you have lentils, beans, dal, they are not easy digestible because they are rich in protein, they are also rich in carbohydrates. And if you eat that both together, it's not easy digestible. So you have to prepare it well, you have to soak it overnight, you have to cook it. As your grandparents did, by the way, they soaked it over the night, they cooked it for 24 hours, it's much easier. Um, and if you look in a modern stylish kitchen, they don't do it this way. So then you get the problems to digest them. Um, I think a combination would be fine to have a lot of vegetables, some protein, yes. Um, keto diet, it's, it's really a problem because the ketogenic diet, it's excellent to treat an epileptic disorder. But it's not necessary and possible and recommended for everybody. That's the same if you go to the Stone Age diet. Yes, if you go back to that uh, part and that time, then you have to live at Stone Age. Then you become a hunter, collector, but you can't live in the 21st century in that way. Yeah? It's too much on the acid side. Yes. Yeah? And the importance of the plant-based diet is that you have a lot of alkaline food, the vegetables, the potatoes, they're rich in alkaline. And if you eat a lot of industrial prepared food, but also the protein, meat, fish, cheese, it's very rich in acidity. So you have a tendency to be on the acid side. And our lifestyle in general brings a lot of acidity in our metabolism. So nutrition should compensate that acidity. And if you eat a lot of acid food, you can't compensate the stress of the life because you have not enough alkaline values. You can do that, but then you have to take some, I would say, micronutrients, some um, uh, supplements like calcium, magnesium, potassium, base powder, which we need in the therapy to help people to, uh, to balance the alkalines and the acidity. But in the diet, you have the vegetables, you have the potatoes, which are the natural sources of alkalines. So I think the answer is pretty clear. Your words, not mine. <laughs> but I do understand what you're trying to say here. Uh, what I would really like to talk about next is that at FSSAI, they work a lot on fats. You know, the, a lot of messaging is focused around the right fats to eat, mm -hmm. uh, demystifying, you know, what are good fats, what are bad fats. There's a lot of work happening on trans fats, and in fact, a lot of good work, and they're pretty ahead in terms of uh, making India trans fat free. Uh, as com in, in compared to the global uh, way. And also, uh, a lot of work is being done in stopping the reuse of oil, which we all know is a really big health deterrent. Personally, your, if you had to, like, in simple words, explain to everybody that we should not really consider fat as the evil, it's not a four-letter word, but how to choose the right fats, and do we really need them in the diet, and which are the ones we do need in our diet? Like you said, you already mentioned you have two ways of therapy there. One includes fat and one doesn't. No, we always include fat, but you the right include. fat. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Fat is not fat, and the evil of the fat is the sugar, not the fat. Precisely. Uh, why? Um, there's a big misunderstanding of fat. People always think if they eat a lot of fat, they will gain weight. Of course, if you overdo everything, you will gain weight. That's not the, the issue. But the right fat, what we really need are the so-called unsaturated fatty acids. We have two, two fatty acids in our body. One is saturated, one is unsaturated. The saturated fatty acids we can produce ourselves, and we made them from sugar. And this is the energy. And you store the energy which you don't use because of your physical inactivity at the moment. You store where you very like it around the hips and the belly button. This is the fat you don't really need. The fatty acids we need are for the brain, are for the immune system, for the skin, for the hormones. These are for the functions also to feel well. We need the so-called unsaturated fatty acids. Unsaturated fatty acids you will find in the cold-pressed vegetable oils or in the nuts and the seeds. We made that or in fish, but it has to be the fish from the sea and not the sweet water fish. So these unsaturated fatty acids are crucial for our functions and uh, concentration, brain function, and so on, they are depending on these unsaturated fatty acids. Um, as far as I know, Mahatma Gandhi recommended linseed. Linseed and linseed oil is one of the best fats you can get if it's cold-pressed. If you heat it, you destroy it. 
That's the important thing. If you heat the unsaturated fatty acids, they are very sensitive to temperature. You destroy it, you damage it, you produce a lot of first trans fatty acids and then a lot of toxic fatty acids. And trans fatty acids, um, they also have a long history because we thought they are healthy, they, they are helpful because they are also unsaturated, but they have no biological function. So trans fatty acids have to be reduced in our food. These are the damaged fatty acids. Um, we know, and there is a an, uh, an word from uh, the University of Maastricht and also the University of um, Harvard, if we reduce the trans fatty acids by 5% in nutrition, we reduce the heart attacks by 25%. So it has a strong influence on cardiovascular diseases. So therefore it's important to take the natural form, the unsaturated fatty acids in huge amounts. And huge amounts, it's really, we would need two tablespoons per day yeah. of these fatty acids. Um, if possible, and I think it will be, put it in the fridge to keep them as fresh as possible. Don't buy big bottles, except you have 10 children to survive, then you can do so. But if it's only for you, take the, uh, buy the small. small bottles. Dark glasses, that's also important because light temperature and oxygen destroys that fatty acids. So keep it in the fridge, well closed, stored on a cool place and use as soon as possible. Don't put it on the table, I have it, look at that for half a year and then take it. That's the wrong way. Yeah? <laughs> Use it as soon as possible as you have it, uh, because that's the benefit uh, we need. And also for pregnant women, most important to optimize the development of the brain of the baby. Yeah, we know that these fatty acids are crucial for the development of the brain of the immune system. We know that a lot of disorders can be avoided if the pregnant woman has have enough fatty acids at that time. And also allergies can be protected if you have enough fatty acids. So both aspects are important, avoiding the bad fats and <coughs> inc I mean, having enough of the good fats in yes. the daily diet. Yes. That is how it works. That's absolutely right. We would, before we started this conversation here, doctor, we were discussing about how important it is for the doctors to know about nutrition as well when we were sitting in ma'am's room. And um, <coughs> personally also I feel that if we can just make a small or even a mediocre shift towards focus on prevention rather than just the treatment modalities that we, you know, the world over everyone is focusing on, most of the problems will get solved. You think that is the course that we've really faltered on? I think the education is uh, really important. As I said before, we as a medical doc doctor, we are trained in pathologies. We are not trained in physiology as much as we should, and we are not trained in um, protecting uh, diseases by nutrition. Uh, Special nutrition, we are trained in clinical nutrition to survive people in accidents, in intensive care situations, but not as, uh, as a doctor to give you advice how to eat healthy. That's not enough, and I think that should be part of the education of the training, much more than until now. <clears throat> um, nevertheless, I think it will be also important to start the training program from the very beginning. Yeah? Uh, during kindergarten, during the first uh, years of school, we have been to China a couple of years ago and they have started a program where they have in the, in the kindergartens and in the schools, they have educational programs for these children to eat in the right way and to train them to have the, the healthiest food. And so if you start as early as possible, then it will work. On the other side, education is not necessary. Children, um, they, they copy us more or less. So if we train parents to eat in the right way, they will train their children automatically. I think we are very at the very beginning in that. Um, I don't know if the medical doctors are the right people to do that because they have um, a lot of other things to do. But there is not enough training as far. Um, I've seen that this is not India on its own, this is Europe, this is the Western world itself. We're always talking about food, but the specialists are not talking about the nutrition, they are talking about different foods. They are maybe food experts, but not nutritional experts. And that's also one of the, of the problems. Uh, maybe we should ask our grandparents to do that job. 
Yes, they, they were doing they could that. They do it till, much better than yeah, anybody. Yeah, they were else. doing that till they were allowed to. Now nobody really <laughs> listens to them anymore. That is, I think, where we most of us have gone wrong. It hasn't really got passed on. I feel to the next generation. So I uh, think a lot of this is being done by Etrite India. At least effort is there to take the message on to the schools and to the universities, and actually creating the fabric of um, or the social fabric where eating healthy by default becomes a habit. I mean, that effort is on, although very early days yet, I would say. But that, I suppose, is the right direction after talking to you. It seems it is the right direction we are moving towards. And uh, I think maybe we would have time for one more question. You could probably but, also tell us uh, a yeah. little bit about your last two books. They were both very fascinating. I read them both, The Viva Maya Diet and also the last mm -hmm. one, which we launched last time, Nutrition, What Really Counts. Yeah. Uh, you talk about if, all this there, right? Yes, before we will do that, yeah. I would say one suggestion um, about, about training and education. If everybody in this room starts from now on chewing every bite 30, 40 times, we have a perfect start in education of people. And you will be asked, don't talk about that. I'm sure you will be asked, what are you doing? Yeah, And if everybody follows that, we have, I think, a great start of this campaign, eating right and chewing well, because I think that's So a lot of people pay simple. a lot of big bucks for this advice. So we've got it almost three years, so the least we can do is, I think, try and incorporate it in our daily lives. I would really like to end here. The only, the only side effect, sorry, is will be you need more than six minutes for your lunch. <laughs> yes, that is directed at we know who. <laughs> Inoshi. <laughs> Okay, so we were, I would really like to end here. I think we're at the end of our time. Thank you, Dr. Strossia. This conversation has been really, really insightful. And as I expected, it's going to help not just our health. It'll help us stay healthier, of course, happier. And it'll help our soul as well. And uh, I would also like to oh, throw open the floor for questions. So can, we, can we begin with uh, huh? Dr. Ishi Gosla? She's here with us, you know, uh, uh, Professor Strossia. So maybe you could reflect on what uh, you just heard and, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh. Dr. Ishii follows all of this as she has been propagating this for a long, long time. We've all learned from her. <laughs> First of all, a very good afternoon, everybody. And it's a privilege to be here and to hear Dr. Stosier speak literally what Kavita is saying, what I have been. Uh, exactly what I have evolved to be as a practitioner. A lot of this, I have to admit, was not a part of our nutrition uh, training and our textbooks, but uh, certainly it has become um, an integral part of my conversations and my practice. And like you rightly said, Kavita, a lot of it is now gaining um, scientific basis. Yeah, to give you a very simple example, a calorie was a calorie for us and it was a myth to say morning or evening. Similarly, the concept of hot and cold foods in our textbooks was a myth. Today, we understand the difference between. So yes, there has been a lot of learning and we have uh, been able to find the scientific basis to a lot of. Uh, and uh, so I think what I would like to just, uh, my initial comment is that food is really much more than nutrition. And if you just reflect on what I'm saying, what we have reduced food in the last 30, 40 years was just to calories, proteins, fats, carbohydrates, vitamins, fiber, phytochemicals, and that was it. And that we thought if we addressed all of that, we had cracked it. And we have apps which could you know, calculate all of these things, and still none of all of this really helped. So what uh, you just, just said that um, food is about pH, food is about, um, you know, there is a timing, there is a circadian rhythm, there's a body clock, it's not the same morning and evening, and food is also about vibration. You just mentioned about the importance of who's cooking your food. You know, that is about vibration. And yes, and there is so much one can today, through quantum physics, understand uh, you know, the importance of all of these things. So, yes, we should not just have a reductionist approach and reduce food to just calories and nutrients, and we need to look at uh, things beyond. And um, 
The other most important part which is talking about the gut and the importance of gut health and that really resonates with almost every form of healthy eating uh, traditionally whether it was naturopathy or Ayurveda or any other. And I wouldn't like to use the word com even complementary, I would just say, or alternative, it's so integral. So we should have a more holistic and an integrated approach rather than keep this as also on the side. So yes, the gut seems to be the seat for everything that's uh, going on mentally and uh, physically in our lives. And I think um, I must make a point here because uh, you very rightly said, you are what you digest more than you are what you eat. And f uh, from the FSSAI perspective, I think uh, this is an important um, area to uh, look at because we are dealing with nutritional deficiencies in a big way. by the government and therefore I think the importance of malabsorption at the gut level is critical. So yes, we are fortifying and we are enriching our food with nutrients, but unless we are really absorbing it, it's really not helping. So from a public health perspective, I think this is an important uh, area to uh, focus and I don't know, I don't have the answers on how to do it, but certainly it needs to be. I'm just trying to say is there's no, sometimes there's no dearth of nutrients, but we are just not being able to absorb. And I think the best example here is the sunshine and the vitamin D, where almost more than 90% of our Indians are deficient in vitamin D. So. I think uh, the answer really, the solution is in going back to the basics, going back to the gut, going back to what our ancestors said, to, to Ayurveda, the Panchkarma, the Panchgavya, the, uh, the Kunjal, the fasting, all of which has been so integral and we really need to revive all that to uh, rediscover all our um, ancient practices and uh, to make this absolutely sustainable uh, approach to healthy eating and uh, to a healthy diet. And if you permit me f two more minutes, I'll just uh, share with you um, a story which seems to be very appropriate to be told here about a gentleman called Amit Vedya. If anyone has heard of his story, he is a 37-year-old gentleman from the U.S. He lived in Los Angeles, and uh, he lost his parents to cancer and heart disease. And he was di diagnosed with stage 3 stomach cancer and, uh, at this age. And um, he, uh, he tried chemotherapy and everything, and um, he wasn't able to. Um, you know, the cancer continued to spread to his lungs, to his spine, and it was all over his body. So he finally came for palliative care to India, to his home country. He was a US citizen, he's always lived in the US. So he really came to India to die. And um, the, uh, when he came to his family here in India, he started reading about yoga and managed to get a yoga expert just to feel a little better. But from then on, whatever he was doing seemed to be helping his symptoms and he began to get encouraged till he finally flew to a health farm, a very basic sort of, not the kind uh, you're talking about uh, in Austria, but a very basic uh, health farm which, co which cost him 100 rupees. Um, and uh, he had to live there in Gujarat and he was basically on just traditional local food on uh, millets, on jowar roti and all the products of the cow. And uh, within a few months, he began to feel a difference. There was cow dung applied to the back on his lesions, which began to shrink. And uh, within a year, his, he became literally cancer free. He was in touch with his doctors in the US. He used to travel to Bombay for his tests and they declared him cancer free in a year. And this just tells you how important and how, what is the potential we have uh, within ourselves, within India to tap and treat diseases and to heal ourselves. So with that, I'd really like to uh, conclude this afternoon today. It's been absolutely um, joy to hear you, sir. And uh, I want to congratulate FSSAI and Pavanji for having such an open mind to engage all of us in these forms of conversations and to take this forward. So thank you very much, sir.
but on a larger scale, and particularly when we are talking public health, um, our role as FSSAI, as government, what is it that we can do to ensure that some basics which are applicable across the board can actually perpetuate down to the lowest level? We have a series of ideas. Uh, we have been working on some initiatives. Uh, one thing which we are now thinking of is, for instance, and I'd love your thoughts on this. Uh, this has come from our CEO, in fact, and I've just been drawn into it this morning. Uh, but we've been talking about, let's say, uh, starting young, catching the children when they're still very young. Uh, the thought we have is of having something like, let's say, an Eat Right Innovation Lab in a school, uh, much like teach children academically or from a distance, but you actually involve them in their own eating habits and habit formation right from the inception. Um, now, something like this in five schools, ten schools, we can see ourselves doing. But how do we ensure that it perpetuates right down to the last child in India so that those habits actually something of a lifestyle. Uh, these are some thoughts we have. So individual diet, very honestly, uh, we have a number of resources and people who can afford them access those resources. How do we make this a huge public health movement? May I ask you, uh, may I answer you directly? We have, for example, in Austria, different kindergartens where the children prepare their food by themselves together, of course, with the adults. They have a written in preparing the food. They don't prepare every day the same food. They have a written. They have every day a different food to prepare so that they get informed about the written, the routine. They eat differently. Of course, they have organic food. They have whole grains and so on. But always um, the children prepare it by themselves. So it's not theoretically. It's a practical education. And if you... Um, start that program and continue that program also in the in the basic school classes yeah i think that will come down to all of them but it's also important that they eat together yeah it's not that they are separated they eat together what they have prepared together <clears throat> so you demonstrate it's enough time to enjoy the food yeah they have enough time to chew and they are educated in also also in that part so i think if we start in that point then we can do that without any theory. Of course, we have to educate the trainers, but the theory is not important. The practice is important. <clears throat> so now it's open for any further observations, questions. with FSSAI. Thank you. So um, uh, my question to you was, do you have any thoughts on infant and young children, feeding of infants and young children? Up to six months, I think, you know, it's clear, exclusive breastfeeding. It's in our country, and I'm talking from the public health and nutrition perspective. The key problem of undernutrition starts there, children six months onwards what to feed, how to feed. Do you have any thoughts? I mean, besides, like, you know, in addition to, or have you done any work, any experiences you would like to share? We'd love to hear those. Thank you. I think one of the most important uh, aspects in that, at that age, is fatty acids. Because for the brain and for the development of the brain, learning abilities, the children need the fatty acids. So here the unsaturated fatty acids are really important. If you rethink, mother milk has the highest concentration of fatty acids in the perfect relation of the omega-3, the long-chain fatty acids. And so we need that too. So we have to train the mothers to, to give the fatty acids to the children. Protein is not so important as we always think. Yeah, protein is important, but not so important. And a lot of minerals, vitamins, you can get also from the vegetables, from the whole grains. That, that would be great to have. But children at the age of six months and even a little bit more, you have to be careful with all these lentils, all these, because they are heavy. So you have to ground them, you have to, to feed them uh, carefully, and also the whole grains, they have to be grounded very intensively, not to, um, I would say, put an overload in the intestines. Okay, 
care um, and I am representing Indian Dietetic Association also over here along with my few colleagues. So my question uh, is, we have talked about Ayurveda which definitely uh, as Ishi ma'am has already spoken that yes it is evolving. I needed to know your views on ghee and especially cows ghee because that's what Ayurveda has been preaching. But medical science talks about unsaturated fats and a mix of unsaturated fats. So just because we were talking on Ayurveda, so I just wanted your views on ghee, what would you talk on? Because a lot of our ancestors used to take ghee. Yes, sorry to disturb, maybe a whole world now, but the uh, nutritional value of ghee is like zero. Uh, why? Because if you take the butter and heat it, you destroy all the important unsaturated fatties, fatty acids in the ghee. So you can have the ghee to cleanse the intestine, to have other aspects, to heat the fat. Yes, that's possible, but you have no unsaturated fatty acids in, like in the butter. Yeah, because the temperature you use to prepare the ghee destroys these unsaturated fatty acids. So there are other values, but not for unsaturated fatty acids. Good morning. Thank you for that wonderful uh, and very insightful lecture. Uh, just a little thought on the fact which you commented that when you give uh, fatty acids, or as you said, the unsaturated fatty acids to, uh, uh, to a pregnant woman, how does that help in preventing food allergies, which is now fast catching up in our country as well? And we're certainly concerned about that. Uh, we have to look a little bit in details. The surface of the intestine are membranes, and these membranes are fatty acids. So in case of an inflammation, in case of an allergy, in case of an irritation of the intestine, we destroy these membranes of fatty acids and we create what we call a leaky gut. And to heal the leaky gut, the fatty acids are really important, as well as an amino acid called uh, glutamine. So the fatty acids you get from the cold-pressed vegetable oils to restore the membranes, to heal the membranes, therefore the fatty acids are important. And then you can close the barrier of the intestine, and then the um, uh, allergies are reduced. But that has to be during the pregnancy. And in the same way, uh, for example, if you have a family of um, allergies and you treat the pregnant woman during the pregnancy with probiotics, with the good bacteria, you have less allergies in the family then, in the children. Hi, Professor Stroshier. Thank you for that interesting conversation. And a lot of my queries have been answered, and thanks to Kavita and Ishi. But uh, there is one question that I'd like to ask you about supplements that you use. And uh, do you give probiotic supplements routinely, or do you just believe in giving fermented <coughs> foods? And also, uh, talking about supplements, there are lots of reports about not giving calcium supplements anymore. It should get it from the food. So what are your thoughts okay. on that? So um, I think, or let, let me compare it. If you want to drive a Formula One car and you want to win the race, you have to take the best fuel. So if you have a stressful life, as we, I think, in that room or many others have, you need the best supply of also micronutrients. And it's difficult to get all the micronutrients by healthy food in our days. Even if you get the best food, it's not enough because we produce a lot of energy. We need the energy. We produce a lot of free radicals and whatever. So I think, and we have a tendency to get an acid metabolism. I think it's important to have let's say, a minimum of supplements to guarantee our yeah. health. Additionally to that, when we want to treat different diseases, and that's also an important issue, if you want to treat different diseases, we have the possibility to use micronutrients or to use medications. Mm -hmm. For example, if you have um, a, a diabetic person, we know metformin is working, we know insulin is working. And of course, we know there is a diet which is also very helpful and fasting is helpful. But because of the situation of a diabetes, the people are very much on the acid side, they have free radicals, they need more chromium to support the metabolism, they need P3 and so on. And it's not possible to take that amount only via nutrition. 
So if we want to treat different diseases, we need these supplements. Another example, if we talk about vitamin C, vitamin C has a recommended dosage of 100 milligrams per day. I think everybody can get 100 milligrams per day to avoid uh, this absolutely deficiency of uh, scabies. But uh, um, if, uh, if you want to treat, for example, a virus infection, you need more. So you can do a medication or you can do vitamin C. If you have an infection, virus infection, and you do a vitamin C infusion, you can get rid of the complaints very quickly. But you need a higher concentration. If you want to treat cancer for specific reasons, you can do vitamin C in higher concentration. But then it's a therapy. <coughs> so we also you mentioned, or the colleague mentioned, vitamin D. Yes, vitamin D is important. You can uh, produce vitamin D, but nobody is going into the sun. Yeah, we live in house more or less, and if we go out, we are covered. Yeah, so we have very low concentrations of vitamin D. Um, how to get vitamin D by food? You have to eat 1.6 kilograms of sardines per day, so it's not very oh, simple to get. Vegetarian. So then it's easier to take a capsule, maybe with 2,000, 5,000, uh, whatever units per day. So we have to look. What is our, I would say, lifestyle, what is our condition, and how to get an optimal concentration. If you do supplements, make sure that you again get the best quality of supplements. For example, if you do <coughs> um, calcium, you mentioned calcium, and we need, let's say, 500 milligrams of calcium per day, and you take a tablet, and the tablet has two grams because it has to be produced, then you need 500 milligrams calcium and you have 1,500 milligrams of substances you don't need. So therefore it's the best to take a pure substance, maybe a powder or as a capsule. But all the tablets, they have some glue in, some preservatives, some coatings because they have nice colors around. You can buy the, the Smarties. I, I don't know if you have that here, this, this little... Uh, but this is not the quality we need to treat people. Yeah, so therefore I think uh, for most of us a minimum supplementation will be important to have. But this is also <coughs> um, a question I think of general health, uh, to put some micronutrients in food. This is what the American do with folic acid, for example, in, in cereals. This is what we can think about um, to do with other micronutrients too. It is, I think, also um, established to, to give a pregnant woman more minerals and vitamins because during the pregnancy uh, they need more. So we have to discuss different things and how to do. But in the therapy, if we want to treat people in a natural way, especially in fasting, when we reduce the um, uh, intake of food, then we need some supplements. And also elderly people, if we get older, and that, sorry, happens to all of us every single day, we need less energy, but we need the same amount of micronutrients. So how to get them? Of course, when we get older, we have more the need for organic food, because there are more micronutrients in. Yeah? And I think this is also a challenge for the industry to produce food with a lot of micronutrients, yeah? because these are the important part of the food. It's not only the calories, it's not only carbs and protein and fatty acids, it's also the micronutrients we need in the food. And of course, if we take the vegetables, we can guarantee a minimum, but in the therapy, I think it's important to have additional ones. So if this time, can I just yeah. ask you, what are the oils you use at your center? Uh, Is it mainly we, <laughs> no, mainly we use flaxseed oil, cold-pressed flaxseed oil, because that's the highest concentration in omega-3. We also have hemp oil, but it's not available everywhere. Um, you have the omega-6 group where you can have the sunflower oil, the, the corn oil, the wheat oil, and so on. And we also have the olive oil for the omega-9 uh, group. No coconut oil? So, yes. Dr. Soshya. So, we in India particularly are faced with a lot of toxic air. We have poor air quality, water issues, food 
a um, lot of pesticides and uh, the animal produce has also got a lot of antibiotics and hormones. And so I think the need for us to detoxify our bodies and the concept of detoxification has to be uh, made more, um, you know, more uh, talked about. So uh, what would be uh, advice from you to us to how do we detoxify our bodies? So first of all, detoxification is not a process you have once in your life and tick it and done and that's it. Absolutely. Um, that's a very, um, it's a process that takes place every second. If you inhale oxygen in the next moment, you detoxify carbon dioxide. So detoxification is a process we have every second of our life. Um, when we have to deal with some environmental toxins, pollutions you mentioned, pesticides, we need fatty acids because they, they are mostly fat-soluble toxins. So therefore, the fat in the nutrition is important because we have to um, add the fatty acids to be able to, yeah, to chelate these substances, to complex them, to eliminate them. Without fatty acids, and also the, the complaints of these pesticides are mainly in the nerve system, in the, in the brain and so on, to, to complex them, to eliminate them, we need the fatty acids. But we also have to make sure that the person is able to detoxify, so we have to open all the valves um, to, to eliminate. So we can use the intestine, we can cleanse the intestine, therefore the ghee is excellent to, to cleanse the intestine. We can do the massages which you have with the oil massages to, to use the skin. We do also massages uh, to help them. And in case of specific detox, uh, de uh, specific processes, we, ca we also can use specific uh, substances to uh, let's say to, to complex the toxins and eliminate them. That depends very specific on what kind of toxin it is. But in general, fasting helps us to detoxify and to eliminate that. And once a year, people should do this period of fasting. Once um, a year? Once a year for oh. at least three, four weeks. Three, four weeks? Yes. And when this fasting would be liquid fasting? Or? No, no, no. No, that, that can be liquid, but it's not absolutely liquid because especially if somebody is toxified with these toxins and you would uh, put a liquid fasting on him, um, then it will be too intensive. Uh, it has to be absolutely individualized carefully because you will have reactions from the reintoxication when you mobilize the toxins. So that has to be, first of all, you have to know which one we have to handle and how to detoxify, especially heavy metals are also important to eliminate that. We have specific substances to do that. So there you have to know what and how to do that. So do you suggest it should be supervised? Yeah. Or, I mean, yes. for, for this audience, how would we want to, if we just no, wanted simple look, detoxification? Look, if we are talking about detoxification of heavy metals, it's yes, not possible we would be via all fasting. Having, yeah. Yeah, it's not possible to, to take any of these toxins like aluminium, mercury, tin, whatever we yes. have in the environment, the yeah. arsenic, it's not possible via fasting because they are so complex in the body. They are in the, in the bindings so intensively um, that we can't mobilize them only via uh, fasting. So we need specific agents to complex and eliminate them. This we have available, there are specific medications to use to detoxify. So that's not possible only with fasting. Mm -hmm. But the intestinal fasting um, uh, detoxification would be a form of anema or what would it be? That could be, that could be an anema. We use Epsom salt, you can use the ghee, you can use a lot of liquids mm -hmm. to eliminate. We, we produce a diarrhea to eliminate. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, sir, I wanted to put up one point here. Uh, I think wonderful session that everybody was knowing it about the chewing, but we never do it. We do it so fast and hurry up and pack up. So we will take and before leaving this room. That <laughs> I agree totally. <laughs> that is something uh, we, we, we rely, but we never do in practice. So I think I, I just uh, take and this thing before leaving this room, we will definitely go for 40 by to see how many days we can do it, but we will try. Sir, here you have just suggested to restore the uh, oil in the that will reduce the uh, depletion or the, the FFA or the 3 fatty acid. 
Mm -hmm. Once again, the fatty acids. You have put into the fuel store the oil in the fridge. The oil. The oil. The oil. The oil. The oil. Yes. Yes. Because we are storing everything in the fridge. I think none of us are storing oil in the fridge. I think. Yes. yes. Because the temperature, the oxygen, and the light damages the fatty acids, especially the unsaturated fatty acids. Therefore, especially when you have this oil, cold pressed oil, put it in the fridge in dark glasses, well closed, yeah. to keep it as fresh as possible. Yeah, linseed oil, yes. Yes, it's the highest the linseed oil. Questions are getting into personal advice. <laughs> 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 and you can't afford his fees, you know. <laughs> no, today it's for free, don't worry. <laughs> uh, linseed oil, it's the same than flaxseed oil. And linseed oil has the highest concentration of omega-3. You have more than 50, sometimes 55, 56 percent of omega-3 fatty acids in linseed oil. So there is no higher concentration in any other plant-based oil than linseed oil in omega-3. The only thing in fish from the sea, you have higher concentrations. Yeah? So therefore, linseed oil is the most important to supply uh, omega-3 to the people. You know, uh, I think one relating to palm oil. You know, India, in India, two-thirds or even more oil that we consume is palm oil. What are your views on that? Palm oil is a saturated fatty acid. You can heat it, you can fry different things in palm oil, but you don't get any unsaturated fatty acid on palm oil. It's a short chain fatty acid. Um, <coughs> high temperature, up to 200 degrees, you can heat it without destroying it. Uh, but nutritional value, sorry, not very much. Not very much. Okay, I think, uh, uh, ma'am, uh, <laughs> Uh, before we thank and remarks of uh, uh, you know what we heard and went through this has been a fascinating journey but want to hear from you hmm. thank you uh, professor Strosier and kavita also for sort of steering it in a way that uh, we could get the most out of this um, we really want to thank you all the people in this room and also all those who are uh, viewing this on video conference uh, for being so clear and focused as well as generous um, with the knowledge that you have uh, acquired and the experience that you have acquired uh, in this area. I think in a sense it's uh, quite appropriate that uh, you are speaking here today um, at the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India because, uh, and this was some uh, brief conversation we had before we entered this room, that unlike traditional regulators for food, this is, and maybe it's because we are young and we are, uh, you know, feeling our way through uh, the area of food safety, that we talk not just about setting the food standards and then enforcing those, but we also look at healthy diets, eating right. And today, I think what we got out of this was that eating right uh, means also how you eat and when you eat and a sense of mindfulness about uh, eating. So I think that's added a dimension how to, how to actually put it out there. And this was also part of our conversation this morning, that sitting here in Delhi as a regulator, how do you ingrain this into public policy? Uh, how are we going to make this happen? Uh, I think uh, Madhvi also had that concern. It, it is a challenge. And I think it's a challenge that uh, will need to be adopt, uh, addressed by all the professionals. We have a room that was heavy on the nutritionists, but I, I am concerned that in the medical profession, where most of us go when they, we have a problem, that uh, the nutrition and how that addresses illness 
and treats it is something that is uh, missing in medical education. S and perhaps, as uh, was mentioned, it's also missing in the education that we give to our nutritionists adequately and uh, to even our uh, caterers, the chefs, all the professions who are gathered in our NetProfan uh, network. Frankly, uh, they themselves uh, have not been equipped may I say, with the tools to, to look at uh, how to uh, use nutrition, the way we eat, and how we eat. Um, these, these are real, uh, really important lessons. I do agree with you that this is an individual choice and an individual decision, but unless we create an ecosystem that uh, enables this, I think it's going to be a continuous challenge uh, people do go to health farms. They do go to, uh, they get some basic principles of Ayurveda, and I have to confess, uh, I am one of those people. The day I retired, I decided that I would go to uh, one of the health farms, fairly well known. Don't wait that long. Huh? Don't wait that long. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what I did, and I had messed up my health completely, uh, as many people uh, who are uh, do in the course of their careers. And to be very honest, much of this was what I imbibed in that brief stay. And it has taken me a year to sort of go back to square one. So I think that this has to be a continuous reinforcement. And uh, we have to find uh, the tools to make that happen. All the professionals in this room, all those who are listening in, but here also for our team at Food Safety Authority, we, we will try and look uh, a bit more deeper into what it is that we are uh, trying to communicate. So thank you very much for making us think so much. Thank you so much. And um, India, I think, is an IT country. If somebody creates a chewing app, I think we would be very successful. <laughs> 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 That's an excellent idea. You know, uh, uh, so, if uh, some of you have seen the biography of uh, uh, Professor Stosier, uh, like me, he's an electrical engineer by training. Okay, and therefore he's very clear in his thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So yesterday he gave this wonderful book, a thin, wonderful book. Of course, he gave me a heavy, thick book also. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, Professor Stosia, you know, I had the pleasure of reading it throughout the night. I read all of it almost. <laughs> and the pearls of wisdom that you just heard are all here. You know, so I strongly recommend that uh, you go through this book. And of course, uh, one thing that has become very clear, that what he said was no different from what we heard from our grandparents. What is the ancient wisdom? What is written in our scriptures? What Gandhiji said, you know, and you saw that movie. So it's all very, very, I think it's not very different. Yet we do not believe it. I think because Professor Stoucher, who is an electrical engineer <laughs> and also a doctor and then he has done a lot of work in medical sciences and uh, uh, nutrition. Uh, so I think it reaffirms our faith in uh, the ancient wisdom that India has and uh, the challenge as a public policy uh, body of the country, as Ma'am mentioned, is to reach these pearls of wisdom, these small simple ideas, so that people start believing in it, start acting on it, and they start chewing their food. So I thank you all. You know, we now uh, close the session, thanking uh, Professor Tushia, uh, uh, Kavita, and our colleagues, Madam Chairman, Chairperson of the Authority, and we have uh, eat right lunch laid down for you and kindly chew. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you.